in the third century BC, our planet was mapped and accurately measured by a Greek scientist named Eratosthenes, who worked in Egypt. This was the world as he knew it. Eratosthenes was the director of the great library of Alexandria, the center of science and learning in the ancient world. Aristotle had argued that humanity was divided into Greeks and everybody else, who he called barbarians, and that the Greeks should keep themselves racially pure. He thought it was fitting for the Greeks to enslave other peoples. But Eratosthenes criticized Aristotle for his blind chauvinism. He believed there was good and bad in every nation. The Greek conquerors had invented a new god for the Egyptians, but he looked remarkably Greek. Alexander was portrayed as Pharaoh in a gesture to the Egyptians, but in practice, the Greeks were confident of their superiority. The casual protests of the librarian hardly constituted a serious challenge to prevailing prejudices. Their world was as imperfect as our own, but the Ptolemies, the Greek kings of Egypt who followed Alexander, had at least this virtue. They supported the advancement of knowledge. Popular ideas about the nature of the cosmos were challenged, and some of them discarded. New ideas were proposed and found to be in better accord with the facts. There were imaginative proposals, vigorous debates, brilliant syntheses, and the resulting treasure of human knowledge was recorded and preserved for centuries on these shelves. Science came of age in this library. The Ptolemies didn't merely collect old knowledge. They supported scientific research and generated new knowledge. The results were amazing. Eratosthenes accurately calculated the size of the Earth. He mapped it, and he argued that it could be circumnavigated. Hipparchus anticipated that stars come into being, slowly move during the course of centuries, and eventually perish. It was he who first cataloged the positions and magnitudes of the stars in order to determine whether there were such changes. Euclid produced a textbook on geometry, which human beings learned from for 23 centuries. It's still a great read, full of the most elegant proofs. Galen wrote basic works on healing and anatomy, which dominated medicine until the Renaissance. These are just a few examples. There were dozens of great scholars here and hundreds of fundamental discoveries. Some of those discoveries have a distinctly modern ring. Apollonius of Perga studied the parabola and the ellipse, curves that we know today describe the paths of falling objects in a gravitational field and space vehicles traveling between the planets. Huron of Alexandria invented steam engines and gear trains. He was the author of the first book on robots. Imagine how different our world would be if those discoveries had been explained and used for the benefit of everyone, if the humane perspective of Eratosthenes had been widely adopted and applied. But this was not to be. Alexandria was the greatest city the Western world had ever seen. People from all nations came here to live, to trade, to learn. On a given day, these harbors were thrown with merchants, and scholars, and tourists. It's probably here that the word cosmopolitan realized its true meaning of a citizen, not just of a nation, but of the cosmos. To be a citizen of the cosmos. Here were clearly the seeds of our modern world. But why didn't they take root and flourish? Why instead did the West slumber through a thousand years of darkness until Columbus and Copernicus and their contemporaries rediscovered the work done here? I cannot give you a simple answer, but I do know this. There is no record in the entire history of the library that any of the illustrious scholars and scientists who worked here ever seriously challenged a single political or 
economic or religious assumption of the society in which they lived. The permanence of the stars was questioned. The justice of slavery was not. Science and learning in general were the preserve of the privileged few. The vast population of the city had not the vaguest notion of the great discoveries being made within these walls. How could they? The new findings were not explained or popularized. The progress made here benefited them little. Science was not part of their lives. The discoveries in mechanics, say, or steam technology, mainly were applied to the perfection of weapons, to the encouragement of superstition, to the amusement of kings. Scientists never seemed to grasp the enormous potential of machines to free people from arduous and repetitive labor. The great intellectual achievements of antiquity had few practical applications. Science never captured the imagination of the multitude. There was no counterbalance to stagnation, to pessimism, to the most abject surrender to mysticism. So when, at long last, the mob came to burn the place down, there was nobody to stop them. Let me tell you about the end. It's a story about the last scientist to work in this place, a mathematician, astronomer, physicist, and head of the school of Neoplatonic philosophy in Alexandria. That's an extraordinary range of accomplishments for any individual in any age. Her name was Hypatia. She was born in this city in the year 370 AD. This was a time when women had essentially no options. They were considered property. Nevertheless, Hypatia was able to move freely, unselfconsciously, through traditional male domains. By all accounts, she was a great beauty. And although she had many suitors, she had no interest in marriage. The Alexandria of Hypatia's time, by then long under Roman rule, was a city in grave conflict. Slavery, the cancer of the ancient world, had sapped classical civilization of its vitality. The growing Christian church was consolidating its power and attempting to eradicate pagan influence and culture. Hypatia stood at the focus at the epicenter of mighty social forces. Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, despised her, in part because of her close friendship with the Roman governor, but also because she was symbolized. She was a symbol of learning and science, which were largely identified by the early church with paganism. In great personal danger, Hypatia continued to teach and to publish until in the year 415 AD, on her way to work, she was set upon by a fanatical mob of Cyril's followers. They dragged her from a chariot, tore off her clothes, and flayed her flesh from her bones with abalone shells. Her remains were burned, her works obliterated, her name forgotten. Cyril was made a saint. The glory you see around me is nothing but a memory. It does not exist. The last remains of the library were destroyed within a year of Hypatia's death. It's as if an entire civilization had undergone 
a sort of self-inflicted radical brain surgery so that most of its memories, discoveries, ideas, and passions were irrevocably wiped out. And the loss was incalculable. In some cases, we know only the tantalizing titles of books that had been destroyed. In most cases, we know neither the titles nor the authors. We do know that in this library, there were 123 different plays by Sophocles, of which only seven have survived to our time. One of those seven is Oedipus Rex. Similar numbers apply to the lost works of Aeschylus, Euripides, Aristophanes. It's little as if the only surviving works of a man named William Shakespeare were Coriolanus and uh, A Winter's Tale, although we had heard that he had written some other things which were highly prized in his time, plays called Hamlet, Macbeth, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Julius Caesar, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet. History is full of people who, out of fear or ignorance or the lust for power, have destroyed treasures of immeasurable value, which truly belong to all of us. We must not let it happen again. <laughs>